Thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here. Well, thank you for coming. Can you let us know a little bit what type of doctor you are and the importance of it? Yes, uh, I get that question asked quite frequent. And uh, the best way to summarize it is I'm trained as an anesthesiologist, which is highly specialized individuals to be able to take care of patients when they're having surgery. Uh, to, that is take, keeping them away from pain, obviously, number one, but number two, uh, to vitally make sure that uh, they stay alive during that process and allow the surgeon to do his procedure. Um, over the years, I've, I've expanded myself into the outpatient setting where I'm a pain management specialist. So I've taken all the tools as an anesthesiologist, which include relieving pain and extending it out to the outpatient setting where I take care and help people manage their persistent chronic pain, either after a traumatic injury, uh, a surgery procedure that they underwent, or just simply chronic illnesses, such as rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia or complex regional pain syndrome, any other type of, of conditions that lead to chronic pain. It's really and like suffering. an art, right? It's like you really n need to be very knowledgeable certain things. Well, the, be the beauty of, um, uh, of anesthesiology and the reason, hence, the reason why I became so interested in that field is because you're trained not only in uh, the anatomy and neuroanatomy of, of the human body, but you also have to be trained in medications and how pharmacologically they, they work. And, and within not only the context of a normal human being, but also a human being that has, may have many other type of disease. So you not only experience in anatomy, uh, pharmacology, pathophysiology of disease, but just also on many types of procedures that, that can help individuals. So it, it's very diverse and allows you to really, truly practice art like a painter, right? It has many different colors and brushes, while we have many different types of modalities and medications to try to help individuals. Now, let's go back to your childhood, a little bit about your story, where you come from, so the um, viewers can know a little bit about you. So did you grow up here in the United States? I did. Um, in, uh, the short version is that I, my parents migrated north. Uh, when I was uh, about six, six years old, I came to the United States. So I was basically entering first grade. So I grew, I basically I could say that I grew up in um, America. So I was born in Mexico, but I'm really truly an American because I, w I was raised and I was educated here all my life. Um, and how was that growing up in your, in, in school, elementary school at that time? Uh, we were actually placed in um, uh, a Catholic school it's called Our Lady Help of, Help of Christians in East Los Angeles, well, more central Los Angeles. So the first two, three years of, uh, that I recall from my education were in a Catholic school because um, at that time, I don't know the exact details, but we could not be in a public school at that time. Um, I believe our, our immigration status was still, um, was still not um, solidified. Um, as permanent residents, and um, and so we were in elementary school for those first two three years, and then subsequently we went into the public schools after that. I believe for me it was fourth grade. Where you grew up? How was that? We grew up. Watch. We, we grew up in a uh, inner city um, uh, housing uh, for low income uh, families. It's uh, called William Mead Homes or. Most people refer to it as Dogtown. Um, another cliche would be Brick City, where things never looked too pretty, because it was a public housing that was made out of bricks, and it was right next to the county jail within an uh, uh, area that was pretty much industrial. Okay. You had uh, industries on one side or the other. There was no really housing around, around that community off Main Street. Down so how was street. that? How was that neighborhood? Um, it was, um, 
you know, as a kid. Well, would you, you know, call it the projects? It's the pro they call it the projects, the <laughs> okay. ghetto. Uh, okay. Some people could refer to it as the ghetto again because it was a, com a community, a very closed, closed uh, community of low income uh, um, families and the city and a lot of things. Um, Bad things happen there. Like I mean, what? they just say brick city where things never look too pretty. <laughs> well, you had a lot of gang infest infestation there. At during the seventies, we had uh, uh, a, a, mix a, mi a mixture of mostly uh, blacks and Latinos, Mexican Americans, and so we they used to be the bricks and the the Crips and the Bloods and versus the Mexicans, and so there was a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that just went that happened on the streets that you probably didn't want to see. Like what? There was, a lot, of, there was ga a lot of gun shooting and people being killed on the streets. You saw that happen? I saw one, uh, one of my friends get killed, yes. Um, and you were playing or what happened? No, I just uh, was, I was walking by and I knew him and some people came right up to him in his front porch, porch and um, they basically just shot him cold there in front. and. We had to put a blanket over him because uh, there was just blood, you know. Just Soaking everywhere? Mm -hmm. He was not involved in, that I recall, in part of the Crip organization. He just happened to just be in a bad place at the wrong time. Yes, that they, normally what happens. People get confused or they try to retaliate once for one person versus another. You know, if someone did something bad, they would just go retaliate no matter who it is. So one of the things that I believe kept us safe um, in the community was that my father and mother never let us out after dark because they always said anything, anything that can happen after dark is usually not very good. And you said that there was a jail nearby. Was there anything that would happen since well, it was so close? Um, well, yes, we used to always get um, the helicopters and the Sheriffs coming in, um, looking for apparently escapees. They um, escaped. Uh, uh, yes, apparently that's what they were looking for. Um, we would always have helicopters and police, anyhow, because of all the Activity. the gang violence that was uh, that occurred in that community. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty common. But um, uh, we also had. Th th I was aware of that situation too, that they were looking for for people who had escaped from the jail. And so in school, how did that change you? Um, did that help? What was it that motivated you or helped you to get out of that environment? Well, you know, as I mentioned, my father comes from educational background and he's always um, pushed for education. So he's always, from the beginning, always told us how important education was. And the most important thing is trying to keep us out of trouble. And so there was always a motivation to seek school and continue to be in school. However, I think what was really pivotal is the, a program in high school, because I went to Lincoln High School. It's a local um, community um, high school. And I believe that what's important there is that we got involved with a federal program called Upper Bound. And it just happened to be that uh, we, my, one of my siblings got first, first got involved with through his history professor uh, got involved with Upper Bound, and then he uh, introduced us to Upper Bound program, and it was a Saturday program where it's geared mostly to uh, uh, low-income families, uh, first-generation um, families who are seeking higher education to get prepared to, to have the grades and get motivated to get accepted to a university and hopefully complete post, you know, postgraduate work too. So there was also like mentorships, um, things like that, that they would assist you? The program was basically is tutoring on Saturdays. Okay. So they would give you extracurricular, you do extracurricular activities, you'll get tutoring, you'll take extra cor courses in, in maybe in, in math mm -hmm. or science. But the real motivation there was the social aspect of being around students from other high schools because Upper Bound was not just for Lincoln High School. It was for, for, um, for, many, for many students and many different high schools within, within East Los Angeles. So like five, six high schools. So we were socializing with other students. And then 
we were also taken to many fun places like Disneyland, Magic Mountain, um, beach, eating, and we get a stipend too for really? going. Really? Yes. How much? I mean, five dollars that back then was That's a, a lot. lot of money back in 1970. So you were rolling in it. <laughs> 76, 77. Mm -hmm. Maybe it went up to ten dollars, but that was that was a good amount of, of money back then for a kid. Mm -hmm. Was there anything um, specific in school? Because you've mentioned that you were in, in the Catholic school and then you went to public school. Is there anything that, that happened to you when you were in elementary? As, as I mentioned, I went to Catholic school for the first three years of my education. And then for fourth, fifth, and sixth, we became part of the desegregation program, um, which is basically to desegregate the schools from, from, from being totally one race, whether it's, you know, mostly blacks or Latinos, and desegregating them to the urban, to the suburban uh, areas to basically have students um, have more diversity in the schools. So we were part of that, that landmark uh, program back in 71, 72, after the Supreme Court had actually, I found out that the Supreme Court in 71 had also um, decided that the federal government could start implementing these programs because the original decision back in 1954 did not, did not do much for the desegregation of the schools. So we are part of that program and I think it was very, very, that was very, very important also in terms of my, when I look at back at my education and what propelled me is the diversity, being able to go to a school in the suburban areas and socialize with not just African Americans and Hispanics, but be able to socialize also with Caucasian people and seeing how they lived, um, their socioeconomic status, for example. I think the exposure of that was very instrumental. And how was that? I, I've always, when I hear a desegregation, I would like movies from the South, you know? Um, especially uh, the African American community getting desegregated and going to these schools. But how was it for a Latino in California? Yes, um, like I said, for me it was to me it was very helpful, and I did I didn't see. To me, it it was just an opportunity. I saw it as an opportunity to be able to commingle with other people from dip different backgrounds. Um, I mean, there was always that racial tension that occurred, but it usually occurred between the Mexicans and the African Americans in the buses, for example. There <laughs> okay. would be fights within really? us, but not with, with the Caucasians. At least that was my experience. Okay. I never saw that. Although I've heard stories that there, there's, there was also uh, issues, going issues on. between the Caucasians and the African Americans from other places where people being, were being bused from South Central LA to other parts of the suburbs. Uh, I heard stories, but not, not in my case. I never had that experience. So for me, it was always a positive experience. As a matter of fact, uh, I learned later on when I was in medical school that when I started med school that one of the gymnastics who won the gold medal for the USA was um, Mitchell Gaylord. And Mitchell Gaylord was my classmate when I was being desegregated to the valley. Oh, wow. Yes, and I used to spend weekends with his family. So, um, you know, to me, again, it was always a very positive experience, and I think that helped me be the person who I, I, I am today in terms of being able to get along with all walks of life. And as a doctor, of course, I deal with, with everyone, every, every type of individual. Okay, so you mentioned there was a program in high school. What motivated you to go into the medical field? That's a very loaded question. <laughs> okay. I think God ordained it. Uh, he always had, had, had that plan for me. I, I strongly believe that. Only because I'll give you a quick story that my dad, when I was young and he used to take us to the doctor, he would say, look, son, look how easy it is to be a doctor. You just get the stethoscope, you put it on, and you could get paid lots of money. And I, I used to say, it can't be that simple, Dad, you know, in my mind. And I didn't want to be a doctor because my dad was pushing, kind of pushing me to be a doctor, like indirectly. Um, so when I went to college, my goal to go to college with the assistance of, of course, 
uh, these programs that we talked about, it was not uh, just to go to college and get an education, but it was to get away also from the community that I grew up with because I knew, I knew it was not a good place and I knew we needed to do better than that. Um, and so my motivation was twofold. One, to leave the community that I grew up with, but also to get an education. That's, that was my goal. I had no clue what field I wanted, I was gonna go into. I, I, I hadn't, like I wanna be a doctor, I wanna be an engineer, I wanna be an attorney. That was never in my book. So what happened is I started to take the requirements, right? The mm -hmm. basic requirements that the school, the colleges require for graduation. Then it came, I was taking science and biology and math and it was a, a challenge because um, I went to a, a university where where the, the, the professors were so helpful. They understood like the, my plight. For some reason, they understood that I probably came from uh, a high school where I probably didn't get the best education. And so they saw me struggle, but at the same time, they were very helpful and patient in helping me. And I spent a lot of my first two years just working hard at getting passing grades for my basic requirements. But I was also studying with students from all walks of life and Latinos and African Americans who were, who were studying science. And I happened to excel in, in, in those areas. So I was hanging around students who were, do, were doing the same thing that I was. And the upperclassmen were counseling us on what, to, like what classes to take and they were applying to medical schools and PhD programs. Mm -hmm. So it was like a motivation right there, just to have that connection mm -hmm. with, the, with students who were doing the same thing, were, were supporting each other, um, you know, experiencing the same thing, as, um, studying together, and then the upperclassmen helping us and advising us. That's how I ended up becoming a doctor because those, those individuals were applying to medical school and I said, well, they can do it, I can do it too. And so then they give, gave us advice as to what steps to take. And now for the field that you went to, what made you want to do that? The students that were, were in my class and the subsequent classes, they were all going into primary care specialties or internal medicine. And I, I kind of wanted to be a little different. I, I didn't want to do the same thing everybody was doing. I, I, I kind of wanted to be myself and, and go into something that I had an interest. So I started to look into areas of surgery and anesthesia. And so um, I actually applied, uh, applied to residency programs in head and neck surgery and anesthesia. And so I, and I ended up in anesthesia. Um, uh, an interesting story is one of my counselors in medical school, when he found out that I was not going into, into um, a primary care specialty like family medicine mm -hmm. or internal medicine, um, he brought me into his office and he said, uh, Miguel, you know, um, I see that you're not going into family medicine. We need Latinos to go into the community and be family medicines. And I, my response was the same response is, well, I want to do something different. We need soldiers, we need generals, we need commanders, we need people in, 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 in a military, you need people at every level. And I said, and I wanna expand my interest in this area and that's, that's how I ended up in, the, in, the, in, in that field. And for us who are not in that field, how is it, like how stressful is it to be like in residency or, or just, you know, when you get that first experience of putting someone under and, and everything goes well for them? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, to be fair, um, r residency, internship and residency, um, it's very, gr it's a grueling, training, at least back in the day, now they've laxed a lot of the, the rules for uh, the, the interns and, and residents because they thought they, was, they, were, abusing, they were abusing the, the trainees too much. Mm -hmm. But to me, it was really good because it trained you how to be very strong mentally and physically mm -hmm. because you cannot give up when you're operating or doing something because you're too tired. 
you have to just overcome that because someone's life, life. is on the line. So to me, that experience was, was, was awesome to be able to feel like you're a real soldier, a warrior, just you know, working for 36 hours at a time sometimes. And um, so anyhow, that's part of the rigorous of being an intern and a resident. So getting back to your question about, specifically about anesthesia, well, anesthesia, you know, it's either, um, it's like flying an airplane. Usually it's pretty, pretty smooth, yeah. right? Pretty smooth, but when turbulence hits or it's raining or snowing, um, it get, get very risky. So you need to be able to know what to do in those circumstances. So for the most part, anesthesia is very safe and things go well, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of times that things don't go well and therefore it's a life and death situation. And that's when I think the adrenaline is rushed and that's, it rushes and that's when I think the training that you, the rigorous training that you go through is important because you need to know how to handle those situations and persevere even if you're tired. What would you say to the Latino community and especially the youth if they're thinking about the medical field and the one of the most important things that the question is, oh, it's so long, it's so long. That's a great question. <laughs> I'll tell you a little quick story. When I was in med, uh, tr going, I believe from, I just applied to med school and I came home and I saw one of my high school friends had a car and I told my brother, look, that guy has a car already. He goes, yeah, he goes, yeah, he has a car, now he has a lot of debt. He goes, don't worry, just keep working hard because one day you'll have a car and, and you'll have a, a degree in medicine. And he was right, it's like, you know, th time's gonna pass by. And all I can say is to the, the, the uh, student um, who, or someone who is interested in medicine, all I can say is that it's fun doing it all the way. It's a matter of an attitude issue. For example, I just gave you the example of even working as an intern and a resident, how difficult that was, working 36 hours at a time, being scolded, just working hard, hour, long hours, going to the library, studying all the time. To me, that was fun, honestly. Yeah. Yes, it was, it was fun, and it's hard to, to convince that, to, to translate that to individuals, including my children, right? Because they always think it's a long time too, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I always try to tell them it's fun. It's, it's an attitude issue to how you see it. I just came to mind, you know, like you saw your, your friend, you know, pass away because of a gunshot wound. And, you know, years later, uh, when you see a gunshot wound in, in the hospital where you're helping, you're able to help, you know, because now you have the skills for it. So it's interesting how life just, you know, will take you places. Yes, and I, I also understood, like, when someone came in and you couldn't save them and they died, whether from it's an accident, a traumatic accident, or um, a gunshot wound or a stab wound, right? Mm -hmm. um, I understood very well because when you save, when you're able to see someone be saved and make it through out of the hospital after an event like that happened, there's a deep gratification in that too that you're able to help. So be part of a team to help an, ind an individual come back and function again. And over the years that you've been a doctor, what has that taught you? The most important thing, humility. Believe it or not, humility and being closer to God because as I've gotten older and seen a lot, I got to appreciate just how complex our, uh, God made us and the potential of our bodies also to regenerate themselves and heal themselves and the ability uh, that God has given us so many different tools to help people directly and also help people help themselves. So. Um, that's what I think I've learned the most is just uh, the humility of knowing that I really don't know everything um, and that's what allows me to persevere and keep learning more and more and more. Is there like a, uh, between your faith and science, is there something where it's a balance that you see? Where you're like something, something happens and you're like, I can't explain this. <laughs> Does that happen often? Well, one thing's you know, one thing is being uh, uh, aware of the mysterious, right? Uh, appreciating the mysterious of of life. But what's interesting um, is that once you 
put faith in God into that, that uh, understanding of the mystery that we don't have the answers to everything, it completes the whole picture because your faith in God that he's in control of things. Because uh, if you just look at it just as a mystery with no answer, then it's, it, it's a dead end. It's like dying and not knowing where you're going, right? It's like to the abyss, right? But if you have faith, okay, you have faith in Jesus Christ, you know, that, uh, that you know, he died on the cross, et cetera, et cetera, and that he, wrote, he conquered death, right, yeah. through his resurrection, and that through that faith we are going to be resurrected one day to be with him forever, that's great faith. That com that's uh, an awesome perspective to have. And I think it's just so important. And that's what I think what gives me peace um, at my stage of the game. And it, it definitely helps me with medicine too because even though I don't understand things, I know that there's always a reason for, thi for the things the way they are. And it doesn't, it always gives, gives me hope that I'm not in control of things, but God is in control of things. Just as I mentioned about my career becoming a doctor, it wasn't because I necessarily made it all happen. Yes, I worked hard through it, but he, he guided my footsteps. I decided maybe which way to go, but he's the one that guided me to where I am. And he will continue to do so until one day I get to meet him, hopefully, with him. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Doctor, for coming in today and um, telling us a little bit about your story and your life. Thank you. Nice to be here.